This meeting is being recorded. To read it, Ted is a student of of Reo Māori. I think at the early stages, but a little bit ahead of me, I think. And so I thought it would be good to have a student of Reo Māori read our Bible reading this morning. And it's more of a professional word, Reo Māori. Yeah, I'm much more of a beginner than uh, Anna, and uh, did three levels of study last year, but I've still got to uh, keep it up. Te rongapai o hoani upoko te koma fa nga fiti te koma rima ki te koma waru ki te aroha koutu ki aho ki a mo ki a kuture ki inoi ka inoi aho ki te matoa a mana e hoatu ki a koutu te tahi atu kai fakamarie he noho tonu ki a koutu ko te wairua o te pono e kore nei e riro i te ao no te mea e kore e ki te I a ya i kore a no e mato ki a ya ke a koutu hoki i a e noho ana a ka noho a no i roto i a koutu e kore koutu e waiho pani e aho e haere mai ano aho ki a koutu amine. Namihi Ted, thank you, thank you very much. Happy grammar. Could you just pass me that clicker? Thank you. All righty, we're going to now we're going to watch that Bible reading and, and a little bit further on from verse 18 right through to 31. So sit back and watch and listen to this Bible reading as it's acted out. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father. And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. 
He has no hold over me. But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And may God speak to us through this reading that we've heard both in Te Reo, Māori, and in English, and act it out for us too. May we digest it and apply it to our lives as we, uh, as we unpack it further in our message this morning. In four weeks' time, it's going to be my final Sunday, sadly, here as your pastor at All Nations. Um, that kind of seemed like a long way off, and now it's all of a sudden starting to seem like it's creeping up, well, more than creeping up, it's coming up very fast. Um, after church today, Pastor Neil and I will be meeting with our ministry leadership team to start preparing for that transition, that handing over of uh, my pastoral responsibilities to the team and to, to Senior Pastor Neil as he um, picks up where I leave off. I'm sure Pastor Neil and our ministry leaders, and just to remind you of who they are, that's Catherine, Catherine Park, Jenny, um, Joseph, and Kent. Uh, well, they're going to continue doing the great job that they're already doing, and I'm sure that that's uh, going to go very well. And Anna, I forgot Anna in there. <laughs> Um, but I still can't help wondering and even worrying a little bit about how things are going to go after, after I've gone. My thoughts and feelings as my departure draws closer have given me just a little bit of insight into how Jesus must have been feeling as his departure drew very, very close, as we've seen um, in that, that Bible reading, as he shared his last supper with his disciples and really had what was kind of like a ministry leadership meeting with them because in that time over the last supper he explained what was going to happen next and he allowed opportunity for his disciples to ask him questions which he then answered. So it was really a discussion, it was, it was kind of like a, a leadership team transition meeting in a way as he prepared them for his departure. So even though I've been kind of able to identify a little bit in terms of what Jesus would have been feeling. I've also been thinking about how much more concern must Jesus have felt at this point as on the eve of his departure, it was the next day that he was going to be arrested and, and crucified, or well, that evening actually, um, and he was down at this stage in his ministry to just 11 disciples. Judas had already left a bit earlier that night, uh, ready to go and betray Jesus, and he just had his 11 disciples plus a few close friends, and that was it at this point. Um, um, at the near on the eve of his, his his departure from the from the earth. John 14, 15 to 31 is part of what's known as Jesus' farewell discourse. But actually, it was more like the ministry leadership team meeting that, that I'm going to be having along with Pastor Neil and our leadership team um, soon after church. During the meeting, Peter, Thomas, Philip, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, and in fact all of the disciples asked about Jesus about where he was going. But why couldn't they go too? How would they know the way, they asked. And why was he only going to show himself to them and not to the whole world as, as they were hoping he would do? Crucial to Jesus' departure plan was, was introducing the disciples to someone who would come to help them after he'd gone. He was getting them ready to meet the paraclete, as, as his name was in Greek. In English, the name is sometimes translated comforter, helper, helper or counsellor. However, since paraclete is, is a Greek courtroom term for someone who's called alongside to represent and defend someone, advocate is the name that best describes the function of the one who would come to be with them after Jesus was gone. Now, since this week, as we've already been hearing, is Te Wiki o Reo Māori Week, or Māori Language Week. I'm going to introduce you to the one who is going to come alongside Jesus' disciples as Te Kaitonaki, which is the Māori word for advocate. So, this morning we're going to meet Te Kaitonaki, the advocate, who was coming to help the disciples after Jesus had gone. So let's meet 
the advocate as the one who helps us appreciate the tonga of Jesus' words. In rabbinic Judaism, disciples who've lost their teacher were considered to be orphans. That was the, the predicament that the disciples were facing as when Jesus announced that he would soon be departing from them and they would soon be without their rabbi. Without their rabbi, they'd be rabbinic orphans, disciples who'd lost their teacher. And the obvious problem of a group of disciples without a teacher is that they'd soon start forgetting what their teacher had, had taught them and would begin drifting further and further away from, from what they'd learned from their rabbi. Which is why the advocate's role is such an important one. Anticipating their concern about this, Jesus said to them that he won't be leaving them as orphans like they were worrying about because he will ask the Father and the Father will give them another advocate, the Spirit of Truth, who would come alongside them and recreate the person of Jesus in them, within them, teaching them all things and reminding them of everything that he'd said to them. Hence, they would not become rabbinic uh, disciples, rabbinic orphans, after he was gone. That's how come we will never be rabbinic orphans either. And you certainly won't be rabbinic orphans after I've gone. Although we don't have Ihu Karaiti, Jesus Christ, here to teach us face to face as he did with his original disciples, we do have Te Kaitonaki, the advocate, otherwise known as Wairua Tapu, as we've been singing about this morning, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of truth, whom the Father has sent in Jesus' name to teach us all things and remind us of everything that he said. But how come Jesus says he will give them another advocate? I wonder if you noticed that in the words. Another advocate, as if they already had an advocate. Well, that's because Jesus already was their advocate to the Father. According, I was advocating on, on his disciples' behalf to his heavenly Father. That was one part of Jesus' role for them. Whereas the advocate that he was going to send to them would in fact be Jesus' advocate to them, who would continue communicating and teaching Jesus' words after he'd gone. So they really had two advocates, Jesus advocating on their behalf to the Father, and the Holy Spirit advocating on Jesus' behalf to the disciples. So while Jesus is our advocate to the Father, Te Wairua Tapu, the Holy Spirit, is Jesus' advocate to us. This was such an important lesson and such an important point for his disciples to grasp that later on in his farewell discourse, and it's quite a long speech that he, he gives, he repeated this point to them in John 16, 13 to 15. Now, I don't know how much of you have, have picked up on um, Te Wiki o Reo Māori this week. I mean, you can't help, really, because in the news, it's been a lot of, of Te Reo Māori has been spoken and various um, things like we got, like watching the project and the Friday night project. It was all in Te Reo. You had to follow along in English. Um, so there's been plenty of it, really, in this week, if you've been, been watching along. But this week, during Te Wiki o Reo Māori, the 50th anniversary of Pitihana Reo Māori was celebrated. And what a celebration it was. Um, I watched it live on, on Māori TV just to see what was going on because I didn't know that much about it, really. Thousands of people packed our parliament grounds, and I mean thousands, it was full, to, to hear speeches and waiata honouring the occasion um, when 50 years ago, a group of Māori language advocates led by Hana Tehemara, took a petition to Parliament signed by 33,000 New Zealanders, many of them white Pakeha people like me, but, but a mix of people, 33,000 names on it. And this was their petition. That Māori language and culture be offered in all schools with large numbers of Māori students and offered as a gift to the Pakeha from the Māori in all other schools as a positive effort to promote a more meaningful concept of integration. That was the petition that they took to Parliament because that had certainly not been the case prior to that. Their advocacy for the Māori language was the catalyst for awakening a new appreciation of the Māori language as a, as a tonga, 
a treasure of New Zealand that needs to be taught and passed on from generation to generation to generation. Otherwise, it would be in danger of being lost forever. And it was not far off that point at, at that stage of history. And now here we are, 50 years on from the, the Te Pitihana Reo Māori, and the Māori, the Māori language has since become an official language of New Zealand, of Aotearoa, and is being widely taught in, in just about every school. Our kids certainly learnt some Māori as they grew up, um, all because of the petition that a group of Māori language advocates took to Parliament 50 years ago. I think it's a great example of what advocacy is all about. Advocacy involves communicating a tonga, a treasure, that's in danger of being lost, as the Māori language was in danger of being lost, to someone who's oblivious to the consequence of losing the tonga, as most uh, Pākehā were ob oblivious to, by someone who is able to communicate the importance, as the Māori language advocates were, for someone who can do something about it which was the New Zealand governments uh, who could certainly do something about it if they chose to, as they did. Similarly, the advocacy we've been reading about in John 14 involves communicating a tonga that's in danger of being lost as the teachings of Jesus were in danger of being lost after Jesus had gone. To someone who's oblivious to the consequences of losing the tonga, as the disciples were pretty much oblivious to, by someone who is able to communicate the importance of the tonga, as the Holy Spirit does, for someone who can do something about it, which is us with God's help. This is what was going on in John 14. This is what Jesus was communicating to his disciples about the importance of the one who was coming after him, the Wairua Tapu, the Holy Spirit of God. When you read Jesus' teachings in the Bible, when you listen to a sermon like you've been doing, what you are doing right now, are you conscious of the Holy Spirit's advocacy for the tonga of Jesus' teaching? I wonder if you are. I wonder if you're just thinking, oh, this is Ken preaching a sermon this morning. It happens to be from God's Word, but it's really a sermon. It's actually more than that going on, really, if we're tuning in to what the Holy Spirit is doing in the process of, of taking part in a sermon together where the Holy Spirit is present and speaking through his word and hopefully speaking through, through the, the, the teacher, in my case, me. Are you aware that this precious tonga was and still is in danger of being lost to the world? Do you sense Te Wairua Tapu catching your attention with the significance of Jesus' words? Because that's part of his role. He brings it to our attention when you get that sense of oof, being hit in the, in the, in between the eyes with part of God's word that, that the Holy Spirit is speaking us to us through. Do you appreciate the Holy Spirit helping you live out the tonga of Jesus' teaching through, through what you do and what you say as you go about your everyday life? Have you had that kind of sense of what the Holy Spirit is, is doing in you, helping us to live it out? Do you realize that without the help of the Holy Spirit's advocacy, the tonga of Jesus' words would have been lost to the world a long, long time ago? If it was just up to the disciples to keep it going, it would not have survived. It was up to the disciples with the help of the Holy Spirit, which is why the teachings of Jesus are still alive and well today because of the Holy Spirit's advocacy for, for, for it. So have you met Te Kaitonaki, the advocate who helps us appreciate, really appreciate Jesus' words? I wonder. Oh, I forgot to put up that slide. <laughs> That was, that, that was the, the Māori Reo advocates uh, heading for, for Parliament steps, bringing this 33,000 strong petition to, the, to one of the Parliament members on the footsteps of Parliament. Now let's meet the advocate who helps us share in the father and son's aroha for each other. This is a very, another very important part of the role of the advocate. Ten times Jesus uses the word love in his farewell uh, team meeting, I'm going to call it, his farewell team meeting to describe his relationship between the father and the son. 
between the Son and the Father, between the Son and his disciples, between the disciples and the Father, and the Father and the disciples. Love comes up over and over again in, in, uh, in this farewell team meeting. It's a love quadrangle that's, that's going on that involves Jesus showing his aroha for his father by keeping his father's commands and the disciples in turn showing their aroha for Jesus by keeping Jesus' commands. This love quadrangle was, was about to be demonstrated in the most powerful way of all by, by Jesus obeying the Father's command to lay down his life out of love for the world and for his disciples. And in response, the disciples would lay down their lives out of love for Jesus by serving one another. Yet this love quadrangle isn't easy to share in. Otherwise, we wouldn't need an advocate to come alongside us to help us share in the Father and the Father and Son's aroha for each other. Which is why Jesus wanted his disciples to meet the advocate who helps us share in the, the Father and Son's aroha for each other. Several years ago, I remember going to, uh, probably more when I had younger kids, uh, but I remember going to, to a Father's Day breakfast with Ian Grant. Anybody heard of Ian Grant? Quite a few people have heard of Ian Grant. A uh, wonderful Christian man who's, who's really a guru, a guru on, uh, on parenting, and uh, particularly in terms of, of fathers. He's got a specialty and a wonderful teaching uh, ministry on that. During his talk, he told us about a father <clears throat> who, since he was often away from home because of his work, decided that every month he'd take his daughter on a daddy date. The first date was, was at McDonald's, and I found a, this photo of, that might kind of represent what was going on. After getting their order, they sat down at one of the tables, the dad with his Big Mac combo, his daughter with her Happy Meal, and gazing into his young daughter's eyes, the dad said, I love you, darling. This little girl's face lit up with a big smile over her face, and swinging her little legs back and forwards, said, Say it again, Daddy! I love you, darling, the dad said again. I love you too, daddy, the little girl said back with a cute little smile on her face and a giggle. Say it again, darling, the dad said to his, to his daughter. And backwards and forwards they went, saying, I love you, say it again. I love you, darling, say it again. But on and on and on it went for, for, for several minutes with, uh, I suppose, probably a few people wondering what on earth this, uh, these, these two were doing. They could have spent their whole McDonald's daddy date just saying the same thing over and over again. I love you, darling. Saying it, say it again, daddy, daddy. I love you, daddy. Say it again, darling. The parenting experts and psychologists call it imprinting. The bonding that happens between parent and child when they spend quality time together. Long before the parenting experts discovered the importance of imprinting to the parent and child relationship, Jesus was teaching the importance of the Holy Spirit's role in imprinting the bonds of love between Father and the Son and his disciples. That's what was going on in this, this chapter that we've been reading this morning. You see, the, advocates, the advocate helps us share in the love quadrangle between the Father and the Son as he comes alongside and whispers in your ear, the Father loves you, darling. And you reply, say it again, Daddy, which the advocate whispers into the son's ear, and the son whispers into the father's ear, I love you, Daddy. And the father whispers back to the son, say it again, son. And the son whispers to the advocate, the son loves you, darling, which the advocate whispers back in your ear, and you whisper back to the advocate, I love you, Jesus. And the advocate whispers back to the son, the darling loves you, Jesus. And so on and so forth it goes, this love quadrangle of communication, of aroha love for each other. Father, son, son, father, son, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, disciples, disciples, Holy Spirit, son, father, round and round it goes. I love you, darling, say it again. I love you, daddy, say it again. I love you, Jesus. Say it again. When the advocate comes alongside to help us share in the Father and Son's love for each other, we'll never
never, ever again be unloved. Never. Because we participate in this love quadrangle that goes on and on and on. So what do you do to, uh, to deliberately participate in the love quadrangle between Father, Son, Advocate, and you? What do you do to participate actively in this love quadrangle? What's your version of going on a daddy date with the Father, the Son, and the Advocate, I wonder? Well, coming to church is like, is like going on a spiritual daddy date. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before, but that's one of the really important things about joining together in worship of the Father, through the Holy Spirit, to, through the Son, all present as we worship. We're on a daddy date, a heavenly daddy date, right now in this time we're spending together in worship of God. Having a regular quiet time of prayer and Bible reading is another kind of spiritual daddy date that you can do pretty much any time, but doing it on a regular daily basis, if possible, is, is a good, good thing to do. It's another spiritual daddy date. What about serving people who need our help at church, at home, at work, at school, in the neighborhood? That's another way of showing our Heavenly Father how much we love Him by obeying Jesus' commands to serve one another. We're actually on a kind of a spiritual daddy date as we serve and help one another, whether it's in the church or at home or out in the neighborhood or at work. So what do you do to deliberately participate in the love quadrangle between father, son, advocate, and you, I wonder? Have you met the advocate who helps us share in the father and son's aroha for each other? I hope you have. And now let's meet the advocate, the one who makes kainga with us and with the Trinity. Every summer since our kids were very little, our family has gone camping together, usually beside the, in fact, I think it's always been beside the beach. We like beaches <laughs> over summer. We used to go camping in a caravan when we had a caravan. We got rid of that and decided to buy just a big canvas tent instead. And actually, I think we prefer camping in our big canvas te tent than we, we do uh, the caravan, even though it's a bit of a pain putting this big canvas tent up at the, the start of our holiday, but we usually get there in the end after a few frustrations. As our kids have grown older, it's become, it's become more difficult um, getting them all together at the same time because of their jobs. And, and three of them are now married, and one couple uh, now have a little baby. So there's, and we haven't yet had a camping holiday with our, with our grandson yet, but we're hoping that might happen these holidays. But as their parents, we're still committed to going camping together with, with as many of them as possible with our kids because there's something special, we reckon, about being away together, away from the pressures of work, the pressures of everyday life, and even away from the home comforts when we go camping together. I'd even go as far as saying there's something spiritual about going camping together. Perhaps that's why the, the Old Testament Torah includes a law requiring the Israelites to go camping together every year for the Feast of Tabernacles. They would have experienced something of this getting away from it all, going camping together as they remembered the Feast of the Tabernacles. I heard of one family, perhaps it was the same family with the dad who, who took his daughter on a daddy date every month, that when it came time to, to pack up camp to go back home at the end of their camping holiday together, their little girl had had such a wonderful time camping that she turned to her daddy and asked, Daddy, can we make our home here? She just wanted to carry on camping for the rest of, the, the rest of their days. Jesus told his disciples something similar. He said, because the Father and I love you, we will come and make our home with you. We will come and camp with you. Notice how he didn't say, I will come and make a home with you. He said, we will come and make a home with you, as in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all going to come camping with you. Imagine tenting with the Trinity. Actually, you don't have to imagine because that's what actually happens when the advocate comes to make a home with us as Jesus promised he would. Jesus had already explained to the disciples that on that day, referring to the day when, when they would see him again after the resurrection, 
you will realize that I am in the Father and I am in you and you are in me. Which means that when Jesus told them that the the Father would send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, once Jesus had returned to heaven, it wasn't just Te Wairua Tapu who would be joining them. It would be all three who came to make their home with them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would make their home together with the disciples. Kind of like tenting with the Trinity. Now, you might think that sharing a tent with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would be, well, it would be a bit overcrowded, wouldn't it? Maybe a bit like our family of six on a a wet day, crowding into our little wee caravan, um, where usually, you know, that was a recipe for kind of squabbles breaking out when you had to spend too long in close proximity with each other like that. But that's not how it is when tenting with the Trinity. Because Jesus said that fellowshipping with the Trinity is a relationship of peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. These must have been such reassuring words for the disciples as they began realizing that that Jesus would soon be gone, but yet they wouldn't actually be without him. Because the Holy Spirit was coming, who would represent him to them. And what was true for the original disciples is also true for us. It is. So whatever changes lie ahead, whatever challenges we may face, those who tent with the Trinity won't let their hearts be troubled and will not be afraid. So have you met the advocate who makes Kayanga a home with you and the Trinity? So let's meet the advocate. The advocate who helps us appreciate the tonga of Jesus' words, who helps us share in the Father's and Son's aroha for each other, and who makes Kayanga with us and the Trinity. This is the role of the advocate, the one who came and is, has now come and is here with us, all who call Jesus their Lord and Savior. He's with us now, doing all this for us. If you haven't met the advocate yet, then I pray you will. So let's pray. Holy holy Kaitanaki Advocate, we are grateful that you help us appreciate the tonga of Jesus' words. We are thankful that you help us share in the Father and Son's aroha for each other. And we appreciate that you make kaianga with us and with the Trinity. Wairua tapu Help us to accept your advocacy of ihukaraiti in our lives. Amen.